Okay, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for joining the uh, Microscope uh, ID Club online. This evening, uh, Pete Leonard is going to be talking about Moth Gendet's A Beginner's perspective, perspective, and I wish I could say that without fumbling over it. <laughs> well, without any further ado, I'll hand the floor over to you, Pete. So, Pete. Fire right, up. okay, well, um... I uh, just, uh, in, well, I, I don't know all of you that well. I thought I'd just quickly introduce myself first. I think like many people of my generation, um, this all started with this book. Um, uh, I, I got this when I was very, very small and it put me onto birds and which became quite an obsession. Um, but I'm actually a, a musician by training. That was my degree, but I've been a bird ringer um, all my, pretty well since I was allowed to. And naturally this led on to moths and I got my first moth trap in my teens and uh, got quite into it in suburban London. Um, but uh, I also did a lot of drawing, but although that's, that's not really be much cool for now that everyone has digital cameras. And I trained to be a teacher and I went off to Africa. And when I went off to Africa, um, the, the bird obsession really did take over and moths took a back seat. Which part of me is, uh, I look back at Africa and think, oh, look at all the moths I could have seen there. But actually, I didn't have time. There was too much bird stuff to do. But that's why you might have noticed my, my profile pictures are a, a papyrus yellow warbler, which is one of my favourite birds out in Zambia. But uh, what I spent much of my time doing in Zambia was atlasing. Uh, and I found it terrifically rewarding work. We had an atlas project that had been going on for, for quite a long time. And uh, I took over coordination of that um, for the last few years. And it just, it, it struck me, it was the most um, satisfying type of field work because every single common species that you recorded could be a dot on a map somewhere. And um, so, so when I discovered that the same was happening with moss in Leicestershire, um, it really lit a fuse with me because it's, it's just the kind of thing I like doing. And um, it's funnily enough, there are quite a few parallels between Zambia and, and Leicestershire in that actually it's, it's not a dissimilar shape. And actually the number of individual tetrads in Leicestershire is quite similar to the number of atlas squares that we had in, in Zambia. The difference being that the ones in Leicestershire are two kilometers by two kilometers and the ones in Zambia were 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers. <laughs> anyway, that's what got me really going with the mothing uh, in Leicestershire. And of course, um, that leads to wanting to identify everything so you can get good records for all your areas and that leads to, to gen debts. Um, but before I go any further, I will say one thing that I am very much a beginner when it comes to this sort of thing. Uh, so please do butt in if I say anything incorrect or you want to add anything, that's absolutely fine. Um, so there are still lots of things that I'm unsure of and I don't know. Uh, anyway. Um, The phrase gendet, when I first came across it, had this sort of strange air of authority about it. Uh, you, you sent your specimens off to the moth gods and it sort of came back and they decreed its identity. And then in my head, I sort of suppose I imagined it was a bit like you opened up a specimen and there was a label inside and it told you what it was. And this was, this was all very magical. And, you know, I'd receive a spreadsheet back telling me what all my specimens were, or occasionally saying that they, they were in too poor condition to be identified. So the first thing that I tried to find out was how could I make sure my specimens were not in poor condition? So I, I did speak to quite a few different people about this, um, and I've gradually refined what I do. Um, but I, I decided in the end that drying things was probably going to be the way forward for me. I didn't really have space in my freezer for everything I was collecting because I was collecting quite a bit. Um, and so what I tend to do now is um, I will photograph anything that I collect now, ideally before I uh, kill it. Um, but sometimes the micros are so impossibly uh, fidgety that I don't. I, te I, I will put it in the freezer and then take it out and take a picture of it when I take it out before it as quickly as possible because they tend to um, curl up quite quickly. And then I'll put it in a tube 
which I'll keep open and singly in that tube and I'll label with a, a reference number. Now that reference number I'll also put on my data spreadsheet so it's all linked up and I'll also name the photo with that uh, reference number too. And then I will put the open tube in a sealed container now, um, which sounds a little bit strange, but I then add, I add lots of silica gel and a mothball or two, and I just seal it and leave it. And so far from what Paul says, this seems to be doing the trick. The specimens seem to be uh, manageable, which is nice to know. Um, so a lot of that advice did come via Paul, um, but I was, was still quite keen to find out more about the process. Um, partly to see if it was something I might be able to do myself. Um, although I did have this annoying obstacle in my way called work, which clashed with a lot of the meetings that Paul was running. But Paul kindly said that I'd be able to join him at some point, learn about this. But then the pandemic reared its ugly head and sort of put the kibosh on all that. Um, but from out of the ashes, a phoenix of possibility arose. <laughs> So, uh, which is, I think actually, like a lot of things that we've learned in the pandemic, these are things we'll take forward. These are really positive things that have come out of all this. So today, what I'm gonna do is I'm talking about two main areas. Um, firstly, um, my steps into the world of examining these genitalia, but also how I've operated with Paul through a sort of online collaboration process, which I think could be uh, uh, rolled out to more people. Okay, so firstly, I'll start with actually looking at the, at the moths themselves and how uh, learning to identify them. Um, although I own an ancient microscope, I haven't actually used it for this purpose yet. So if you don't actually have a microscope, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter at this stage. I have also never personally dissected a moth, yet I sort of feel like I've taken some really useful steps in the right direction. Um, and this process began when Paul asked if I'd like to help identify my own specimens remote, remotely um, using the photographs that he'd taken. So I jumped at this chance, uh, particularly as it was an activity I could do from home during lockdown. And what's more, all I really needed was my computer. I didn't need any extra equipment at all. So I started just by browsing the pictures that Paul had taken to try and familiarize myself with the sort of things that I'd be scrutinizing. And I mean, it, it might sound very obvious if you've done anything like this before, but the first thing I noticed was there was clearly an obvious difference between the males and the females. So as you can see on the screen now, we've got the, the males on the left and the females on the right. Um, now they're not all they're not all quite so similar as perhaps these ones are, but the general template of all the ones I've seen seem to be seem to be similar to this. So obviously this is a very important thing to know when you're identifying moths is what the gender is. Um, I then started uh, trying to identify things with something that had very few options. Um, where I wouldn't have to trawl through endless pictures and things to try and work out what I had. So this is a this is a minor of some description, and we we all know that this is going to be one of three species. And I thought, well, I, if I start with this, this, I know what the options are straight away. So this has got to be similar. And actually, I did this with things like daggers and ear moths, where, where your options are limited. Um, and. These are, this is the genitalia slide that uh, Paul took. And really, all I did first was open my copy of Waring and Townsend and look at the handy little diagrams that were in there. And it was just a case of playing spot the difference. Now, I don't know if you can see there, um, but I don't know if you can even see my mouse if I wiggle it. But what we're really looking at, as it suggests in the diagram, is this clasper that's down the edge. And so the top one says it's short and roughly triangular, then one that's long and almost straight, and then one that's quite long and bent. And I looked at it, I thought, well, it looks long and straight to me. I thought I better check something else as well. So I then went on to a moth dissection website, which I'll come on to again in a minute, and looked at the same three species there. And I thought, no, I'm, 
I'm pretty happy with this. This is a marble miner. Uh, and so I felt like this was a pretty good start. Um, now, as well as Waring and Townsend, that'll help with one or two of the most basic ones. This website that I just showed you pictures from is extremely useful. So this is just called mothdissection.co.uk. And on this website are all kinds of photographs of all kinds of moths of all families. And it's, it can be a little bit overwhelming at first, but it is a wonderful resource. Um, and alongside that, there is actually a Facebook page as well. And only this morning, for example, I was pretty sure I'd nailed an ID for one of my specimens. Uh, and I quickly popped Paul's photograph on the page and said, am I right? And within an hour, I just had someone say, yes, you are, <laughs> which was which was also very satisfying. There's um, this German website is also uh, an absolute treasure trove of information and worth looking at. And the last one I've looked at is this one, British Lep Lepidoptera. Um, and that last one is particularly good for uh, anatomy, I found, because as you as you go on, you find that you actually need to know the names for one or two of these bits and pieces. Not always, but it is useful. Um, so that was quite a nice website for that. OK, so having had a go at uh, some basic knock twids, I thought, well, right, come on, then let's let's try a micro. So I picked this one. And I'd actually labelled this as a, a query Udia species, which turned out to be a very useful pointer. Because um, I went on the Moth Dissection website and look, went straight to the Udia section, immediately found a comparison picture of all the Udia edigi, which is, I think, how you say it, which rolls off the tongue rather nicely. So these are basically Udia penises all lined up in a row. And so I guess that this was probably the part of the anatomy that I needed to check first. So I found the picture of uh, the aedigus of, uh, of my specimen. And you might already be looking along that line thinking, oh, I can see the one it matches. And sure enough, as I went along, I thought, well, th there it is. And again, I got to the identification of rusty dot pearl ferragalis um, pretty quickly like that, which again was uh, was uh, quite encouraging. <clears throat> so with my confidence growing still, I decided to tackle some pugs. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I did wonder whether Gen Dets were going to alleviate my uh, my pug blues. And I suppose the answer is a bit. <laughs> um, this is one of the pictures I had of a male pug's nether regions. And it's a fantastic picture. And everything looks easy to see. And I thought, well, surely this will be pretty quick to match up. Well, I opened up the thumbnail page of the pugs on the moth dissection uh, website and and it did feel a little bit overwhelming here it, it was a bit like looking at the field guide and all the pugs in there but anyway i did i was determined to give it a go so i, I looked through a bit more carefully and i thought oh it it, it does look a little bit like ochreous i thought maybe maybe this is going to be easier than i thought and then i noticed that oh no it's actually quite it's quite like bleached as well oh, that'd be that'd be exciting Oh, but wait a minute, it's, it's quite like grey. Uh, yeah, that looks good. Oh, but so does leg coloured. Oh, and, and plain. Um, oh, it's quite like yarrow as well. Oh, and oh, bugger it, it looks a bit like common. So, uh, right, I decided I needed to be much more methodical about this and try and narrow my search down. So, rather than just trawl in cases like this, I thought, right, I, I need a process. So I started with the VC55 pug list, um, which is available from Adrian. And it's actually on the Google Drive page, things like that, if you want the full list of VC55 pugs. And also, 
I started with the principle that all my pugs were likely to be already known from VC 55. Um, rarities are rare after all. And I then listed uh, the, all the flight periods roughly. So you'll see in about the fifth column along, I just wrote down which months they were in. So that would, uh, that would give me a, a good starting point to think, well, am, am I anywhere near the flight period? I did also notice that actually a lot of my specimens, because they tended to be worn, did often end up coming from towards the end of the flight period, um, because obviously when they're fresh near the beginning, they're easy to identify. Um, then I discounted a few very obvious species. So straight away, I could rule out things like lime speck pug because I was confident that I would have identified that even if it was worn. And then I looked at the data I had, things like the dates and things like the sizes and the habitats and things like that. And I looked at Paul's wonderful external photos. He took his real close-ups. And taking all these criteria into an account, I was usually able to narrow down the options to about six or seven possibilities. And that was before I'd even started scrutinizing the genitalia. But then the game of spot the difference begins in earnest. And for this one, um, however, I, I realized I was looking in the wrong place. In fact, I needed the whole photograph complete with the Aedagus. Because in pugs, I then discovered the Aedagus is, is important, a bit like it was with the Udia. And I noticed it had some very distinctive cornuti which I think is how you say the little tiny funny shapes you see inside the Aedagus, um, which are all quite distinctive in the pugs. And I quickly managed to match this with um, a grey pug. So I'll just bring that over so you can see. And the most distinctive thing which it mentions is this, the, the bit that looks like a shepherd's crook just bent over. OK, so things I've learned so far, I sort of call this reverse learning. Having gone all through, through this, you look back and try and work out, well, what have, what have I learned that's been most useful? Um, I would say that I went through a phase of just chucking on all the detritus in the bottom of my moth trap into pots and thinking someone else will identify it at some point without really bothering to try make an effort to see if I could narrow it down to family. Now I realize it makes a massive difference. If you can find, say at the time, well, it's it's definitely an Eclaris or it's definitely an Udia, um, it does make the job much easier. Um, a photograph of it at the time makes a big difference. A photograph, I sometimes think, at the trap is sometimes at the best. It's when it's at its freshest. Um, and it's also, with some of the micros, the best time because it's when it's sitting still on the trap you can get a photo. And as soon as you pop the things up and try and take it out and take another photograph, it doesn't sit still again, no matter how long you put it in the fridge for. So a, a good photograph at the time is very helpful. Um, being rigorous with your data and making sure it's linked to the specimen and the photographs, and you have a, 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 a clear way of filing that information because there would be nothing worse to me than getting an exciting specimen and then not knowing exactly where it came from because you'd lost track of which one it was. Um, preserving it as carefully as possible. Again, when I started, I would throw a handful, a dozen little micros in a, you know, in a pot together and, and think someone else would sort them out easily. Well, I don't think, yeah, what happens in some of those cases is the pot's emptied out and you've just got a load of heads and wings and legs and you've no idea what belongs to what. So potting them up singly and carefully makes a big difference. Um, and obviously, and this goes for any kind of field work, it's more likely to be something common than something rare. I've identified quite a few of my pugs as pugs as common pugs now, <laughs> even though I really didn't think they were at the time. And agenda might make an identification possible, but it's still not guaranteed and it's not necessarily easy. There are still some that uh, I've uh, been working on that Paul's um, uh, passed on to me, which I'm scratching, my, really scratching my head on, and I, I'm not sure if we'll ever get to the bottom of. Okay, right, so on to the second part. Um, now, this is something which uh, I didn't foresee happening, but which is, in hindsight, inevitable. 
um, with the situation we found ourselves in. But I think it's an exciting development and I think it's something that we might be able to encourage more people around the county to get involved in. So if you know Paul, you'll also know that this process wasn't just a case of him emailing me a few photographs. It was much more sophisticated than this. And if I'm honest, not a little intimidating at first, but I'm going to explain the way we've been working collaboratively and the reasons for it. Now, firstly, we're using an online platform called GitHub. And a sort of a, a typical screen looks something like this. Now, if you are familiar with it, then you probably don't need to listen to it anymore. But if you're not, I'm going to try and introduce it to you in my best primary school teacher terms. And if it helps to, to pique your interest, then this platform's what lies behind our flagship natural history Oracle website that we all know and love, Nature Spot. So, but why, why do we use this platform? Well, it allows us to collaborate in not only storing information and photographs, but also organizing the data. And uh, it enables you to produce a joint report on all the work that you do. So for example, here's some screenshots of the report that will finally be produced of uh, the specimens that Paul and I and others have worked on from the year 2020. And as you can see, it looks, it already looks pretty smart. There you go, you've got a title page, a contents page, and each specimen has its own little section with all the data and the photographs and the information. Now, no one has actually put that report together themselves because the great thing about this GitHub platform is that it does this with a bit of help from the, co the coding underneath, it does it automatically for you. And every time you update a specimen or add something, it will update the report for you at the end. Um, this data can also uh, be exported as a spreadsheet. So it's very easy to send all this to Adrian, which you can incorporate in into the county records and so, so on. And it also, the process allows someone to review the work that's done by myself or others before it's merged into the main project. And therefore, this avoids an enormous tangled mess of contributions. If you've ever used um, the track changes function in Microsoft programs, the rationale is similar. It's just a bit more rigorous and uh, watertight, and it's got a lot more options. Now, despite this interface looking a little bit intimidating and some of the terminology sounding a bit foreign, with Paul's help, I've actually been able to make quite quick progress. And there's an awful lot on here that you can ignore. Um, so the way it works is this. If you're interested in doing it, the first thing happens is that Paul will send you an invitation um, to become uh, uh, a member of the club on GitHub. It looks something like this. And when you accept the invitation and, and log on, uh, you'll have to verify your email address and all the normal kind of things. Uh, but you'll end up with a page like this. And you can see there are two repositories there. There's one called records and one called dissection report. We call them repositories there. It's a bit like it's a filing system, really. Uh, there are two directories, if you like, that are, are full of your stuff. And the one which we'll, you'll be using most is the records one. That's where all the data is stored. However, you need to make sure first that, that you have your own copies of this. So when you click on this records repository, it opens up to look like this. And you can already see down the bottom, there are various, it does actually look like folders now. So it looks like what you might be familiar with in Windows. And there's a folder that says 2020 records and 2021 records and various other bits and bobs that you can ignore. But you need to make your own copy of this. Uh, and this is called forking. You have to fork your own copy of the repository. And that's what I've highlighted with the circle in the corner there. So when you click that, 
you then get your own version in the top. Now I did this using uh, a, a different name so I could play around. So this is the fork that belongs to Frankly Clueless. And you can see his name up in the top left hand corner. So this is an exact copy of everything that's, uh, that Paul has, but it's your own version that you can play around with. So next, how are you gonna find some records to work on? Well, you'd need to scroll down on this page and below those folders, you will see there are various lists. And one of these says Lepidoptera specimens needing ID. And below this, there are currently, well, when I took this screenshot, there are 13 which need help working out what they are. Each one has a catalogue number and it might uh, look uh, a little bit crazy to begin with. But um, if you look closely, you'll see that Paul's system for these, and I've adopted something quite similar, shows you that each one has the year 2020, followed by the month 11, followed by the day 17 and then a time and this is the this relates to when I think when Paul actually uh, looked at the specimen and photographed it. So everyone's going to have an individual catalogue number anyway. So we know we've got some we can try and identify there. So the way I do this is I will copy a file name like that and you can do that in what you can use control C or right click copy there are lots of ways to do this. And then we go to a button that says go to file. And if we click on that and paste in the catalog number that we've just collected, it'll give you a list of files that have that name. Now, as you can see, there are some JPEGs down there. The top one's an RMD, whatever that is. Oh, but look, the second one, which is the one we want to start with, is a nice familiar looking PDF. So we click on that and it takes us to what is effectively the, the page of the report for this particular specimen. And you can see that at the top, you've got the details of where and when it was collected and who collected it. And you've got the photos that Paul has taken of the external characters. And if you are to scroll down, you will find that there are also um, pictures of the uh, genitalia. Now, I find it quite nice to look through this PDF to give me an overview. But actually, when I want to get into the nitty gritty of looking at the genitalia, I'd rather have the individual image files because you can look at them and blow them up a lot bigger. So you'll see the arrow I've put at the top takes you to a file pathway that will be at the top of your page. This shows us where we are at the moment. If you look all along that uh, file pathway, it shows we're we're in records. We're in the 2020 records in the folder that's called PL1. There's the uh, catalog number of the specimen we're dealing with, and we're currently looking at the PDF. Now, if we click on the one with the arrow going to it, it takes us back to the folder for this particular specimen. And we can see that there is the RMD, the PDF and the RDS files, but also there's a folder called images. That's what we want. So we're gonna click on the image folder and then we've got some images. Oh, and then there's another subfolder that's called dissection. That's what we want because we don't want the external photos. So you'll get used to navigating around these. And then you see you've got the images of the dissection. Now, you can look at these and choose which one you think is going to be most useful. But here's the one that I plumped for uh, this morning. And then you can go through the process which I went through uh, earlier of uh, whittling it down and trying to work out what it is using the resources I showed you. Now, once you've done that, and once you think you know what it is, and it doesn't matter if you're not 100% sure, even giving a couple of options is gonna save probably Paul a lot of time when he's looking through things. So it's worth it if you think, well, Paul, I think it's down, I've got it down to these three. So tell me what you think. Um, we can then get into 
the business of letting Paul know. Now, I will tell you now that I've, if you're interested in doing this, I have actually made uh, a file of more detailed instructions that take you through this process, which I'll show you in a second. But effectively, what you do at this point is to alter the code, which sound is very scary. It's a bit like opening up the, the bonnet of a car and diving into the engine because uh, you, we don't often do that uh, much of this, this day, these days. When we work on our computers, we're working in things like Windows where we don't really see any of the innards. But anyway, this is where the RMD file comes in. And you can actually add your information here. So this is a, just a screenshot of part of the RMD file for this specimen. And the bits I've highlighted there are the little bits of information I've added in. So I've changed the determiner, which is now me, because I determined what it was. Uh, I've added in the family, the subfamily, the genus, uh, and the taxon, the species, the specific name. And I've also uh, added a couple of numbers. Now, all that you might think, oh, I don't know what the log number is. I don't know what the subfamily is. Don't worry. All that information is very easily accessible on things like the Mofta section website. And if you're interested in getting this far, then there's some help with that on the, little, on the notes that I've made up. So that was a slender pug, that one. Um, and then once you've done this and you're happy with this and you've saved it, you then make what's called a pull request. Now that basically means you, you, you send a message to Paul saying, look, I've, I've got some stuff for you here. Will you pull it up and put it into the master document or at least have a look at it and see if it's worthy of the master document. And so Paul gets a message and he gets this, uh, the data you put in and it, it actually presents it in a really useful way because it presents it to you and it shows you what was there and it shows you what's it, what it's been changed to very, very clearly. So Paul can look at all the bits I've changed and say, oh, well, that looks all right. Or no, he's made a right hash of that i'll delete that one um, and decide before he merges it and if he does merge it you get a little message back saying yes it's all been accepted everything's fine and you've uh, made one more step on the long journey um as i mentioned then so i've put together uh what i've called github for beginners this is a pdf that takes you through this process uh very slowly and one step at a time if you are interested in having a go at this. Uh, and if you are, then it's freely available to anyone who is, is interested. Um, and then I'm just gonna finish with, uh, I think probably one of my more interesting moths of the last couple of weeks and one which I have retained. So, um, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to do this now because this I identified as a lead colored drab and most of the people I've spoken to have agreed with me, but I've I've come a cropper with this species before. And I've caught what I'm absolutely sure are lead colored drabs only to send them off for gender and have them returned to me uh, as clouded drabs. So I've I've been scrutinizing this pretty carefully and I'm pretty confident, but I would st I still think there's a there's a huge lack of um, uh, photographs online and available of absolutely guaranteed specimens. So moths that have been photographed and have been then dissected and confirmed as that species. And looking at some of the leg colored drabs and clouded drabs online, you think, hang on a minute, I think some of those have been misidentified. So I'm, I'm really hoping that this will in future prove to be a useful reference photograph if we can indeed, conf well, it'll be useful whether we confirm it one way or the other, because if we confirm it as a clouded drab, it's even more useful because it looks so identical to leg colored. But anyway, so it's not just species which you haven't got a clue with that this is useful for. It's species that we want to be absolutely sure of and make sure we're, uh, we're, we're not making a, a mess of, of, them, of them either. Okay, uh, and that's about it from me. Okay, thank you very, very much for uh, that, Pete. I, uh, I really enjoyed it, uh, even though I've been a um, part, part of it. Um, uh, one just uh, other little thing to add. I mean, I was chatting um, to, uh, to Kirsty from the, uh, the records office today, and we've agreed that 
I will periodically log the PDF report and the, the accompanying uh, spreadsheet with them so that uh, in the future, if somebody wants to, oh, I want to have a look at record ID such and such, they can cross reference and see the photographs from yeah. that uh, determination. So I think you did a brilliant job of explaining it. And I do apologize to everybody that it can seem a little onerous in some ways, but this system would work with a hundred people or a yeah. thousand people. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's designed uh, to do that. And it always, as Pete says, keeps the master report in perfect condition because I can review everything before it goes in. And Pete, you've saved me hours because it often takes me three hours a specimen it takes me you know i can do a dissection and take those photographs in about two hours and then there's another three hours so one yeah. day yeah uh, specimen. but this this system just makes it so much more uh, feasible for lots of people to join in now um and it, even people like me who aren't actually even dissecting anything yet um can actually get involved and i think it i i've learned an awful lot just in the short time i've been doing it that will help me in other ways uh doing moth field work um it's just making me look at things in a different way mm -hmm.